morning. Hey, it is super glad to see you here today. I can't think of any other place I would rather be today than right here with you. And I love the verse in the Bible that says, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. And I hope that you are glad to be in God's house today with other believers, worshiping an awesome God who has done so much for us this week, especially if you're a visitor. I, we're just really pleased to have you here today, and we pray and hope that you have a wonderful experience with us today. And if you would just do us a favor, if you would reach out in front of you, and there's going to be a visitor's card right there in the pew, if you would fill that out and put it in the offering plate when it's passed later so we could have a record of your visit with us today, we would appreciate that so much. But we are so glad that you are here today. Uh, well, we got many things kicking off and getting going the next couple of weeks. I want you to be aware about. You can read about these things in detail in, in your bulletin, but I want you to know that this Wednesday night we are kicking off our, our fall activities on Wednesday nights with our children's choirs, RAs, GAs, Mission Friends, Supper, the Youth Bible Study, everything. We have something for you no matter who you are or where in life that you are. And so we would love for you to come and join us, and you'll see those times listed in the bulletin there. And then also I pray that you would make note that on September 11th, uh, we're going to have a fall kickoff to our, our church year. And I uh, got a special speaker coming in that day and got some special things going on in our Sunday school classes and departments. And we hope that that will be a, a big day in, in Sunday school and in worship. And uh, we look forward to celebrating our church on that day as we kick off the new year. But I'm super glad to be here and to be with you, and I hope that we have a wonderful experience together this morning. So let's stand and welcome one another this morning. <clears throat> It is so glad to see everybody here in the house of the Lord this morning. Um, we're going to ask that you remain standing or be seated if you're more comfortable. But we're going to sing, um, Come Christians, Join the Sing. time of worship this morning singing about all the great things he has done for us come let us worship our king come let us bow at his feet he has done great things see what our savior has done see how his love overcomes he has done great things. 
He has the greatest. Oh, hero of heaven, you conquer the grave. You free every captive and break every chain. Oh, God, you have done great things. We dance in your freedom, awake and alive. Oh, Jesus, our Savior, your name lifted high. Oh, God, you have done great things. You've been faithful through every storm. You'll be faithful forevermore. You have done great things. And I know you will do it again. For oh, your promise is yes and amen. You will do great things. God, you do great things. Oh, hero of heaven, you conquer the grave. You free every captive and break every chain. Oh, God, you have done great things. We dance in your freedom, awake and alive. Oh, Jesus, our Savior, your name lifted high. Oh, God, you have done great things. And hallelujah, God, above it all. Hallelujah, God, unshakable. Hallelujah, you have done great things. Let's sing hallelujah. And hallelujah, God, above it all. Hallelujah, God, unshakable. Hallelujah, you have done great things. You've done great things. Oh, hero of heaven, you conquer the grave. You free every captive and break every chain. Oh, God, you have done great things. We dance in your freedom, awake and alive. Oh, Jesus, our Savior, your name lifted high. Oh, God, you have done great things. You have done great things. Oh, God, you do great things. God, we thank you. And we love you, God, because we know that you are a hero of heaven. God, you conquered the grave. You defeated death. God, and you did it all for us because of your love for us. God, we thank you. We love you this morning. We just are so blessed to be in your house. We love you and we praise your name. Amen.
Tore him is him 358. Share his love. We'll sing all three verses. Let's stand and our ushers will come at the end. Christ is 
pray with me. Father, how blessed we are to be in your house today just to be able to sing praises and to hear your word spoken. And Father, I pray that you bless these tithes and offerings so that we can continue to share your love throughout our community, our state, and the world. In your holy name I pray. Amen. Today, Lord, our children step into their world of learning, wearing their favorite backpack, carrying their new bag of pencils, eager to explore the world and see their friends, stepping into many unknowns, for sure. I give this year to you, Lord. May I not overlook the small victories or the big wins. In all the busyness, help me to stay focused, but also get rest and to enjoy the day, no matter the challenges. Committing to begin and end every day with prayer to you. I give this year to you, Lord, my own fears that I may carry into it, managing expectations that go along with new experiences. May I trust your will for my child, however you see fit, in all the beautiful moments and the excitement of accomplishment but also in the failures and struggles. I know you are there, waiting to teach, to discipline, to reveal wisdom no matter the age. I give this year to you, Lord, because in your hands, it will be beautiful in all the ways that matter, on this earth and in eternity. Exciting time of year for our school, our teachers, and our students as they go back to school. And along with that excitement comes some anxiety and some anxiousness and often a, a sense of wonder. And, and teachers and administrators and, and uh, students, I want you to know that we've been praying for you as you have gotten off to school this week. And we want to have a special prayer time for you this morning. I love the verse in the Bible where God says, I have, not, have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be frightened and do not be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. And so tomorrow morning, when you get up 
when you take off the school, your God is going to be right there with you wherever you go and whatever you face. So what an awesome promise that is to each one of us. And so I'd like to ask if you are a, a school administrator, if you're a school teacher, a coach, an aide, uh, if you teach at school or at home, or if you are a student in any kind of way, if you would just stand up for so we could see you. We want you to know that you are important to us and you are so special to us and we're going to be praying for you as we take off in this school year. You can be seated as I want to lead us in a prayer for us this morning. So would you pray with me? Father, we thank you so much for this exciting time of this year and we pray that you give our students a thirst for knowledge and for wisdom and for understanding. God, may their hearts be ready to learn this new school year, whether it be at school or here at church or at home. God, I pray that you would open their ears, that they would desire and crave knowledge, and they would do their best to learn and seek it out. God, you provide wisdom for all who ask for it, and we pray this morning for our school administrations that you will grant them the clarity of mind, the unity of spirit, the heart of wisdom, so that they might be able to make good decisions that lead to the growth of our teachers, our staff, students, and for the well-being of our community. God, we thank you for our teachers we pray that you would strengthen them with your power this school year. Give them guidance on instruction, and strength to complete all tasks, and patience and desire to joyfully teach our students. Give them efficiency as they work. And God, may they find the rest that they need and they feel your presence this year. Lord, we pray for the emotional and physical and spiritual protection over our students. Keep evil from them and help them to trust you as their refuge and their strength. Father, we pray that you would show our students the right path this school year. May they not be influenced by the unwise, but that you would guide their choices. Show us the right path as a family, that we would place our time and energy on the things that you would want us to invest our time and energy in. Lord, and most importantly, we pray that our students and our teachers will develop a passion for you. God, and I pray that they will grow to love you with all their hearts and all their souls and all their minds and all their strength. Father, I pray that they would always work hard and strive for excellence, but I pray they would do it with a servant spirit of greatness rather than a worldly view of success. God, we look forward to what you're going to do with our teachers and our students and our school this year. In Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen. shines for all the world to see look at the cross I see salvation rise your voice like thunder calls the dead to life 
our great God, a mighty warrior, our great God, you go before us, our great God, is on our side, through every storm and in the rising seas, we will not fear you stand in victory, here in the light we cast aside our shame. And we are free to glorify your name. Our great God, a mighty warrior, our great God, you go before us. Our great God is on our side. Yeah, our great a mighty warrior, our great God, you go before us, our great God, is on our side. If it wasn't for Jesus, we'd still be all alone. If it wasn't for mercy, we'd still be on our own. If it wasn't for Jesus, we'd still be all alone. If it wasn't for mercy, we'd still be on our own. If it wasn't for Jesus, we'd still be all alone. If it wasn't for mercy, We'd still be on our own If it wasn't for Jesus We'd still be all alone If it wasn't for mercy We'd still be on our own Our great God A mighty warrior Our great God You go before us our great God is on our side. Yeah, our great God, a mighty warrior. Our great God, you go before us. Our great God is on our side. Thank you all so much, and thank you, choir and Nancy. What a wonderful job this morning in all our music. If you have your Bibles, please take them and turn with me to the book of Colossians 3.18, and we're going to jump back in where we left off several weeks ago, Colossians 3.18. And before we get started, I just want to thank Dr. Bush and, and Kyle Dykes for filling in for me the last couple of weeks, and especially Dr. Bush for for checking in and making sure everything stays like it needs to be around here the last week while I was gone. I appreciate you and Miss Joyce so much, so thank you for that. We did have a great time at the beach, and while we were there, uh, my oldest daughter, Sydney, and my grandson, Grayson, uh, came for a few days and spent the time with Lori and Kendall and I. And, and of course, one day when we were at the beach, we had to, to build a sandcastle. And uh, as I grabbed one of the, the buckets to start putting sand in it to build the castle, uh, Grayson, who was three and a half, said, no, 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 Dubs, that uh, bucket is for water. And I said, oh, of course, Grayson, that's exactly right. So I went to grab a, another sand bucket and he was, and to put sand in, and he goes, no, 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 Dubs, that uh, bucket is for shells. And I said, of course, that is. And so... I went to grab another bucket, and, and Grayson said, uh, 
uh, no, 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 Dubs, that's, uh, that bucket is for the, the rake and the, the strain and the net and the, 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 the shovel. And I was like, yeah, of course. And, and so as I went to reach for the last bucket we had, I was like, Grayson, is it okay if I put sand in this bucket? And he was like, yes, of course, Dubs. <laughs> that bucket is for sand. And for whatever reason, Grayson got in his little mind that each bucket can only be used for one thing. And you had to keep them separate. And later this week, as I was thinking about that experience, I thought about the people Paul was writing to in Colossians. And isn't that how many people kind of live their lives today? It's as if we live our lives in buckets. Now, over here, we have our Jesus, our church, our spiritual life bucket. And, and then over here, we have our, our career, our work, uh, our occupation, how we provide for our family bucket. And, and then over here, we have our, uh, our, our parenting, our marriage, our perfect little family kind of bucket, and, and then over here we have our, our wife or our husband, our, our marriage kind of bucket, and, and, and so on. And as, it's as if every area of our lives is in their own separate bucket, and, and Jesus, our spiritual life bucket, it doesn't mix, it doesn't interfere with any other buckets in our lives. And we just keep Jesus in his bucket over here, and we only grab that bucket and use it only if we need him. And many people today think that our faith is a private thing. It's just between me and God, but that's not how our faith works. You see, when Christ comes to live inside of us, and you and me, and when we join our lives with him, he changes us. He transforms us, and when we are transformed, that flows into every area of our lives. And in this letter that Paul writes to the church of Colossae, he reminds us of who we are in him and what that looks like and how that works out in our everyday lives. Our faith may be between me and God, but our faith in Jesus changes everything. And ultimately, our faith will be displayed in all the areas of our life. And when we come to this particular passage this morning, we look at some of the most important areas of our life. And that is our relationships with one another, especially those that we are close to. So let's take off and look at that this morning, starting with verse 18 of Colossians 3. Wives, submit to your husbands as is fitting in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. Children, obey your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord. Fathers, do not bitter your children, for, you will become, for they will become discouraged. Slaves, obey your earthly masters in everything, and do it, not only when their eyes own you and to win their favor, but with the sincerity of heart and reverence for the Lord. Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart, as working for the Lord." not for men, since you know that you receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward. It is the Lord Christ you are serving. Anyone who does wrong will be repaid for his wrong, and there is no favoritism. Masters, provide your slaves with what is right and fair, because you know you have a master in heaven. So the first of all, Paul addresses the Christ-filled family, uh, the family, marriage relationship. Now, in his book, You and Me Forever, Marriage in Light of Eternity, Francis Chan writes this, Marriage is one of the most humbling and sanctifying journeys you will ever be a part of. It forces you to wrestle with our selfishness and our pride, but gives us a platform to display love and commitment. And I believe that is what Paul is showing us in the first two verses in our text this morning. Wives, submit to your husbands as fitting in the Lord. And husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. Well, first of all, Paul writes, Wives, submit to your husbands as is fitting in the Lord. Now, men, 
before you start elbowing your wives, I want you to know that your verse is coming. I was reminded of a story about a man who was complaining about his wife. And he said, my wife is so immature. She's just got to grow up. Every night when I'm taking a bath, she comes in and sinks my boats. All right. Do I got to explain that? <clears throat> so the husband is complaining, the wife is complaining that the wife is immature. But every night, the husband's taking a bath, playing with his boats in the bathtub, and his wife comes in and sinks his boats. All right, got it? Maybe. I thought that was really funny. All right, now the word submit is one of those most grossly distorted words of today, and many wrong things have been done in the name of submission. But the word that Paul uses for submit is the word that literally means to put yourself under or to arrange yourself under someone for a good and proper purpose. And this word totally is a voluntary action. And even though this word is addressed to wives here, it is not just a female word. In Ephesians, Paul writes, Christians are to submit to one another. And in the Scripture, we see the perfect picture of submission as seen in the Lord submitting to His Father. And in no way is this word referring to anybody's value or any worth. He is not saying that one person is more important than another. This doesn't mean wives have to be five steps back and four layers down in life, but He has given order in the family. And He does say that the husband is the leader of the home. And so he is encouraging wives to come under the leadership of your husband. It just means that you recognize that God is, is given structure and that God is given order. But the really striking thing about this command, this verse, is the final phrase, as fitting in the Lord. Because once again, Paul puts Christ at the center of it all. Wives do not submit because their husbands are better or they're smarter, or they're more valuable to God. No, you do so because that is what is fitting and appropriate in Christ. God designed the home, and it is fitting in the Lord that wives submit to their husbands. And then without taking a breath, Paul says, Husbands, love your wives, and do not be harsh with them. You see, Christ-filled relationships are never a one-way street. And here we see the husband's key role in marriage. Love your wife. And here is that agape love word again. The love that willingly sacrifices self in order to serve someone else. It is that love that God demonstrated for us when, he, when Jesus sacrificed himself on the cross for our sins. Now this love is way more than a Valentine's card or going on a date every once in a while. No, Paul is saying, as husbands, we should honor and value and respect and guard and protect and show delight in our wife and sacrificially give our life away for the sake of our wife in the same way that Jesus gave his life away for the church. So wives, submit to your husbands. Husbands, love your wives. And when these two things are working in harmony, you have a beautiful thing. You're going to notice that my mind, in a lot of ways, is still at the beach on vacation. And uh, one of the things that I love to do on my vacation is I love to go sit up on the beach, kind of put my chair, dig a hole, and then, then pull out an umbrella, kind of like this. And... Uh, um, and uh, many of you know how an umbrella works. It kind of comes with two parts, right? And uh, uh, you put it together, and once you put it together, you uh, stick it in the sand, and you pop it up, and then all of a sudden you have a wonderful thing, right? You can sit under it all day, and it protects you and takes care of you from the sun. And, and, uh, but the thing about this, there's two pieces. And if one of these pieces it and there doing their job, you're not going to have a whole something very valuable. If you just have the bottom, it's not going to do. If you don't have the top, it's not going to work very well. But if you have both things working together, 
you have something very strong. And I believe that's what Paul is, is, is painting a picture here in, in our verse. And when a husband under God seeks to lead his family, and his wife says, my husband is doing his very best under God to lead our family, and I like the way he's leading our family, and I'm going to come up under him, and I'm going to encourage, and I'm going to support him as our lead our family. And then the husband says, at the same time, I'm going to love you, babe. I want to put you first. I want to serve you with everything I got. I want to make sure that you are valued, that you are cared for, and you're led well. And when these two things work together, you have a beautiful picture of a Christ-filled marriage. Then secondly, Paul comes to the kids and shows us what a Christ-filled parent-child relationship looks like. And I love this idea that Paul is writing this letter to the church. He addresses, he includes, he is talking to you kids. That tells me that the kids were there. Uh, They were a part, they were present at the early church. How awesome is that? At the church gathered and met, children were there in the middle of them. And children, youth, I want you to know that you are so special to me And to this church, we want you here. And we want to help you grow in your relationship to the Lord. And I want you to know that this year, we're working super hard and planning some really fun and exciting things just for you. Because we want you here. Now parents, the truth is, your kids can't be here unless what? You bring them with you. Growing up, I remember this public safety announcement that would come on, I think it was right after the 10 o'clock news, so right around 10.30, and it was this voice. No pictures, it was just this voice. Parents, do you know where your children are? Y'all remember that, some of you? Well, let me ask you parents this morning. Do you know where your children are? Are you bringing them here to church? But as Paul addresses the children, he says, children... Obey your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord. Now the word obey here comes from the Greek word that means to hear under someone. And this is not something new to these kids that Paul was writing to because they probably knew the Ten Commandments. And do you remember, do you know the number five commandment? Children, honor, children, obey your parents. So Paul is writing to remind these children that they are to listen to their parents, to recognize that their parents are over them and they have authority in their lives. Now, boys and girls, I know that obeying your parents is sometimes not very easy. And it's not always what we want to do. But the Bible tells us that we should always obey our parents, not only because it's the right thing to do, But we should obey our parents because the Bible says it pleases God. And when we obey our parents, it makes God, it makes Jesus happy. You see, Jesus obeyed his parents. So when we obey our parents, we are being just like Jesus. So youth, children, obeying your parents is so important. All through the Bible, the Bible teaches that if you listen and obey your parents... It will keep you from danger, and it will give you a good life. I remember years ago when I was probably young high school, we, our family went down to the beach, the Gulf Shores, and one day uh, my parents didn't want to go to the beach; they wanted to go shopping. So I talked them into letting me stay and going out and hanging out with some people that I'd met at the beach. And reluctantly, they said, "Yeah, but Chris, you've been out in the sun a lot the last couple days." Make sure you put on sunscreen and make sure you take the umbrella and you stay under that umbrella the most that you can. And so I said, gotcha, sure. Well, guess what Chris did? Chris went out there, threw the umbrella on the ground, barely put on any sunscreen and took off, swam in the ocean, played volleyball, played football all day long. Well, later that night, um, after I took a shower and after I tried to lay down in bed, All of a sudden, my back, my body, my head, my arms started hurting all over. Boys and girls, I want you to know, because I didn't obey my parents, because I didn't do what they told me to do, 
I got sunburned so, so bad that later that night, I had to go to the emergency room. I had to go to the doctor, and I had uh, sun poison, and I had to have all this medicine, and guess what? The rest of my trip at the beach was ruined because I didn't pay attention, I didn't obey and listen to my parents and do what they told me to do. You see, my parents uh, didn't tell me to stay under that umbrella or to put sunscreen because they didn't love me or because they didn't want me to have a good time. They told me those things because they did love me and they wanted me to be okay and they wanted me to have a good time. And so Paul is saying, hey children, Obey your parents in the things of the Lord. Obey your parents the way they're leading you. And if, if our mom, like I just said, is, a, is an umbrella, then children, we need to get under our umbrella, mom and dad, because they want to lead you and your family to glorify the Lord. And when we do that, we experience the Lord's blessing and the favor and protection in our lives. And then he flips the coin and says, Hey, parents, in particular fathers, do not embitter your children, or they will become discouraged. As parents, we have been given a far-reaching authority in our children's lives, but we must be very careful to use that authority lovingly and wisely. As parents, we can't just take the shortcut and say, Children, you're to obey your parents. The Bible says it, and you've got to obey me. Maybe you remember... Uh, the old country song by Rodney Atkins called Watching You. Driving through town, just my boy and me with a happy meal in his booster seat, knowing that he couldn't have the toy till his nuggets were gone. Green traffic light turned straight to red. I hit my brakes and mumbled under my breath. His fries went a-flying and his orange drink covered his lap. Well, my four-year-old said a four-letter word that started with the S, and I was concerned. So I said, son, now where did you learn to talk like that? And he said, I've been watching you, Dad. Ain't that cool? I'm your buckaroo. I want to be just like you and eat all my food and grow as tall as you are. We got cowboy boots and camo pants. Yeah, we're just alike, ain't we, Dad? I want to do everything you do, so I've been watching you. We got back home, and I went to the barn. I bowed my head, and I prayed real hard. I said, Lord, please help me help myself. Then this side of bedtime, later that night, turning on my son's Scooby-Doo nightlight, he crawled out of bed and he got on his knees. He closed his little eyes, folded his little hand, and spoke to the guy like he was talking to a friend. And I said, son, now, where did you learn to pray like that? He said, I've been watching you, Dad. Ain't that cool? I'm your buckaroo. I want to be just like you. And eat all my food and grow as tall as you are. We like fixing things and holding Mama's hand. Yeah, we're just alike. Hey, ain't we, Dad? I want to do everything you do, so I've been watching you. You see, the parent-child relationship is one of the most important relationships God has given us. And this specific command here is not to embitter your children. The word here is from the word to stir up or to arouse or irritate and is used in the present Continuous tense, so it is saying, do not keep on irritating your children or they will become discouraged. I once heard about a father who was in the military and every morning he would line up his children and give them their orders. And as he was finishing giving their orders one day, he asked, does anybody have a question? When one of his sons shot up his hand and says, yes, how do I get out of this family? <laughs> I'm glad y'all got that one. <laughs> Now, of course, we need to have structure in our homes, and we need to discipline our kids. We need to hold them to a high standard and to teach them to strive for excellence. But we cannot make them our idol of our identity. Because when we do that, we begin to put unrealistic, unfair expect expectations on them. So Paul says, don't push your kids to the brink. Don't create an environment where it's never good enough where nothing's never right, it's not what you wanted, you always can do better, because all this will lead to discouragement. John Newton, who wrote the song Amazing Grace, made this really sad comment about his dad. I know my father loved me, 
but he did not seem to wish me to see it. Parents, do not embitter your children, for they will be discouraged. And then finally, thirdly, he comes to the Christ-filled relationships at work, where he writes, Slaves, obey your masters in everything, and do it, not only when the eye is on you, and to win the favor, but with sincerity of the heart and reverence for the Lord. Now, this text was written in an ancient culture several thousand years ago. And in this, in this context of this passage, it is obviously referring to the slaves and masters. And it's, an, and it's important to understand that in no way the Scripture is condoning anything about this culture, but rather is speaking about the transforming power of of a relationship in Jesus in the middle of this culture. So I think it's helpful for us today because we don't live in that same context of slaves and masters to take this and let it bleed into our relationships today in the workplace because many of us spend a lot of our lives in the workplace. And Paul's appeal is very clear here. We are to work as into the Lord. That is to be our motivation it is the Lord Christ we are working, we are serving. Every employee ought to write that down somewhere where you can see it during your work hours. It is the Lord that I am serving. So if I'm a preacher, I want to do it for God. If I'm a teacher, if I'm a student, I want to do it for God. If I'm a heart surgeon, if I want to do it for God. If I work in a quick service food industry, I want to do it for God. If, if what I'm doing is being seen by a lot of people, I'm going to do it for God. But if I'm doing a task that I feel like no one is watching, I still want to do it for God. I read a story this week about a missionary to Africa that was responsible for getting the nationals in his area to do certain type of jobs. And he discovered quickly that they were rather lazy and would only perform when he was standing there watching them. But when he left, they would stop work and do nothing until he returned. But this missionary had a glass eye. And one day, as it was irritating him, he took it out and put it on a stump where they were working and went to the bathroom to, to, to wash it out. And when he returned, he found that everybody was still working because that eye, as they thought, was watching them. And he thought he had found a great way to free himself up and get these people to work until one day he returned and discovered that one of the workers had snuck around and behind the stump and put his hat over that eye and everyone was lounging and enjoying themselves. But you see, as Christians, our work should be different because Jesus is in us and the work that we do takes significance when we do it for Him. Why? Because of verse 24. God sees everything, and He rewards faithfulness. You see, when we go to work tomorrow, we work for a bigger purpose than recognition or a paycheck. But we work for God and His kingdom and for His glory. And He sees our work. He sees what a we do, and he recognizes our effort, and Paul reminds us that God is going to reward you for your faithful work. And then Paul flips to the masters. Masters, provide your slaves with what is right and fair, because you know that you also have a master in heaven. See, Paul is reminding them to treat everybody as human beings with honor, with respect, with fairness, with grace, in the same way that God has treated us. Again, we're not in that context, but some of us are employers. We are the bosses, the supervisors, the managers. And Paul is saying, just don't tell your people what to do, what you expect of them, but show them how much God values them and how much you have come to understand that. My first job... Uh, growing up was cutting grass, and my first boss was my granddad, Paul Paul. And uh, the, uh, every Saturday, 
I would hop in my car and I would make the drive across Montgomery to his house, his house early on Saturday morning and, and we would spend time talking for a little while and enjoying each other's company, learned a lot and, and then he said, well, let's, let's go cut the grass and we'd go outside and we would get his uh, Honda self-propelled lawnmower all ready, we'd check everything and, and then we'd go out to the front yard where we would start. And he said, Chris, stand right here and watch me. I'm going to show you what I need you to do. Every Saturday, stand right there. I'm going to show you what we need to do. And so he would start, and literally, my granddad would start cutting, and he would cut. And he would cut half the yard, and then he'd come to me. You got this? And I'd say, I think I got it. And then I would go and cut the grass. We would finish. I would go inside, and we'd spend time uh, talking and and uh, sharing and having a good old, good old time. But you know what? To this day, I still use a Honda self-propelled lawnmower to cut my grass. You see, when my granddad died a few years later, he wheeled me his Honda self-propelled lawnmower. And there's not a time that I don't go outside to cut my grass that I don't think about my granddad and those things that he taught me, not just how to cut grass, not just about work ethic, but about life and about God and about the things that I will face in the future. Wives, submit. Husbands, love. Children, obey. Parents, lead. Employees, do as if you were doing it unto God. Employers, do it as you were doing it into God. You see, the gospel is not just a private thing. It's not just a bucket that sits over by itself. The gospel was intended to work itself into every part of our lives, not only to change us, but to show those around us the supremacy and the sufficiency of Jesus in our marriage, in our family, and in our workplace. Would you pray with me? Father, thank you for these uh, very practical words from Paul this day. And, and as we read and look at this scripture, it's really where the, the, road, the rubber meets the road, God. It's uh, so practical. And uh, you've, we've addressed some of the important relationships in our life today. And the truth is, uh, we will never be perfect in all these relationships. Uh, we will fail and we will uh, get things mixed up and... And uh, it's so easy to become selfish and prideful in these different areas, God. But I pray that you would help us to, to understand that, Christ, you're the center of everything. And not just for our salvation and not just to get to heaven, but, God, you are to be center of every part of our life in every relationship. And, God, I hope that we would be able to apply that to our hearts and our lives uh, today. God, thank you for this time together. In Jesus Christ I pray, amen. As we close our time together, I, I thought the this, this simple little song, uh, Lord be glorified, would be appropriate uh, to, today. So if you would uh, stand and sing as we close our time together, 554, Lord be glorified.
to you that uh, uh, if you were downstairs any you probably uh, smelt something pretty strong this past weekend we uh, began doing some painting uh, in, in the kitchen and so because of that we've had to postpone our sunshine club for this Tuesday to the next month so please be aware of that of course if you want to uh, bring some food up here uh, Tuesday and for me I'd be glad to take that and uh, uh, that's that's up to you but uh, um, we won't have Sunshine Club that day so uh, just be make note of that um, Paul Holly will you close this with prayer this morning please How great is our God, sing with me, how great is our God, and all will see how great, how great.